and tales for dark nights. The following performance is a third round entry in the 2016 Evil Idol voice acting competition. And you, the listener, get to help decide who wins. If you'd like to hear more of this contestant, voting for them is simple and only takes a moment. Just click the thumbs up icon. Can't stand them? Then click the thumbs down icon instead and cast them into the digital nether realm from whence they came. You decide their fate. Good luck to all of our contestants. The Prince, written by Jeffrey E. Bright and performed by Charlie Davenport for Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and the Evil Idol competition. I light another cigarette. My lips, pursed upon the filter, draw the tobacco to ignite as my lungs crowd with smoke. I had quit the habit some ten years prior, which may explain why I choked and wheezed through the first pack. Yet as I remove the coffin nail from my mouth, I find I have adjusted to the cancerous vice quite nicely. The numbness of shock still envelops my body as I stare at the cigarette staining my fingers and emitting this sickly bluish-white smoke. Smoke lazily ascends my index and middle finger, briefly twisting and curling in the air before joining the small cloud held hostage by my apartment ceiling. All the while, my mind replays the horrid thoughts of yesterday evening without respite. To see me in my present state would be alarming, to say the least, for my hands tremble uncontrollably, my face twitches involuntarily, and my eyes dart with wild paranoia. This description does not take into consideration the wrinkled and soiled clothing which hangs upon my unfed frame like an ill child to its mother's bosom or my hair resembling a loosely bound fodder shock deliberately ignored for lack of usefulness. Speech would be the most damnable of all, for it would flow in disjointed sentences of a high hysterical voice devoid of sanity, saturated in urgency. Please let me assure whoever is reading this account that I am not insane. Rather, I was not insane before the events of last night. As my shaking hand pens these words, I remain unsure as to my current mental status. Of course, who among us could be solidly confident of anything after witnessing the horror I viewed? But I digress. My name is Alan Ketridge, and like my father and his father before him, I was born and raised in the Pentecostal lifestyle of a sleepy little town named Waverley's Crossing. To call the town Backwoods would be unfair. Waverley's Crossing resembled many other cities which were always on the verge of cosmopolitanism, yet restrained themselves for want of a simple life and basic moral values. We shared the same creature comforts as larger metropolitan cities, but our town was not bound by oppressive metal and glass skyscrapers which stretched like Jacob's Ladder to heaven. Waverley's Crossing is a community in the greater sense of the word. And when my beautiful mother, Anne Carlyle Kettridge, birthed me in 1952, Waverley's Crossing beamed with pride over their newest resident. Of my school years, there is little to report. I was an above-average student who, despite my father's best intentions, 
excelled in the thespian arts in lieu of sports-related activities. Do, do not misunderstand. I was not a fragile youth bereft of athletic ability. I was merely inclined more towards mental progression than physical expression. In 1970, I was presented a high school diploma and steeled myself for the ultimate fear of my 18-year-old life, adulthood. Before I had time to ponder my options, the United States government decided my course of action. Selective Services Lottery had drawn my name. I was to go to a small, turbulent country called Vietnam. My wartime assignment in the Army was as a crew member on a Lockheed C-5 Galaxy transport plane. Each mission we would shuttle equipment, supplies, and soldiers fresh from boot camp, both gun-ho and reluctant warriors, were released into the foreign deltas. Their untarnished, naive spirits soon to turn hard in the unforgiving face of war. Yet I was not to escape the devastation and destruction of this military conflict. After the new arrivals had long departed the airfield and joined the conflict, we deployed our secondary mission. Though I was never to see battle, I was to reap the harvest sown by this malefic war. In the sickly humid air, under the blazing Vietnamese sun, our crew began loading to see soldiers, swathed in the olive drab cocoons of the standard U.S. Army issue body bags. If I were to relate the most disturbing aspect of my experience in country, it would be the dehumanization of those brave men that filled our cargo hold like so much cordwood. I shall never forget the smell of the generic green plastic body bags intertwined with the stench of decaying flesh. The horrific aspect fell to the fact that I might have known the spoiling carcasses we loaded into the belly of the plane. Perhaps I had even shared a cigarette during the long trip. To know familiar faces were most certainly encased in those body bags, staring with glazed, lifeless eyes disturbed me to this day. I am thankful I do not suffer from post-traumatic stress syndrome, but the remembrance still chills my bones. Twelve months later, I returned to civilian life with a crystal clarity of purpose and direction. I entered college and studied philosophy and the social sciences. Long after President Nixon's strategic withdrawal of U.S. troops from Vietnam, I graduated with a Ph.D. from Miskatonic University. I resettled in my hometown of Waverly's Crossing. Though it was not the most prestigious place to begin my career, I accepted a professorship at Western University. I was no longer a young man, rapidly approaching my forties, so my options were few indeed. Therefore, I welcomed this employment. It took a matter of five years before I became the head of the philosophy department at Weston. I am proud to report my sterling record and the excellent academic standards which I instilled in both students and staff. In review of my scrawlings to this point, I believe I have sufficiently established my credentials. I have also exhausted two more packets of cigarettes in the process. I now feel I may offer the incident which has pulled the proverbial carpet of reality from underneath my logically planted feet. I shall spread my pen and brace my nerves, for someone must know what transpired. Someone must realize what has been unleashed upon our fragile spinning planet. Someone, perhaps you, brave reader, must stop this unchained horror before the hour grows too late. The events leading to last night's terror began two weeks ago. 
which seems like another lifetime now. I was teaching a remedial philosophy class with the topic Heaven and Hell, Social and Theological Aspects. From experience, I knew this was to be a heated debate due to the inherent volatility of the subject matter. I allotted a full week for this discussion. The first day started general introduction, the next two days in the Judeo-Christian angle, a day for Eastern philosophy, and the final day delving into paganism and alternate beliefs. It was on that final day that Tim Nozick became vocal. Tim Nozick, more commonly known around the campus as the Death Dealer, was the savior of the Western University football program. His six foot six, two hundred and ninety pound frame of solid muscle single handedly put Western in the coach's top twenty five pole for three years running. Not only was the boy a destructive defensive linebacker, he was part of a rare breed that played offense as well. Third down, full back, short yard specialist. His face, seemingly chiseled by an inspired Grecian sculptor, held piercing blue eyes. His golden hair, long and feathered, would have completed the image Hitler had sought for the master race. To be kind, what he had in the way of physical prowess and beauty did not balance his struggling academic record. Yet he walked the halls of the school as if he were its progenitor. Any words spoken from his full lips seemed prepared and deliberate in the execution, and were normally delivered as a rebuttal. I cannot recollect the actual tangent we had been debating that moment. Whatever the case, Tim Nozak's voice severed all discussion and drew all eyes to him. The Prince is God, he stated. Excuse me, Mr. Nozak, I uttered, bewildered at the force of his words. The Prince is God he repeated. Prince? Yes. Would you care to elaborate? I was duly intrigued. Yes. At this point the room fell uncharacteristically silent. He spoke with a reflective confidence. I was twelve years old. I was diagnosed with a rare type of bone cancer. Doctors said I wouldn't make it to my next birthday. There was no cure, they said, so it was terminal. I prayed to the Christ God, he sneered, and it got worse. Really? I was intrigued with no words to back up my intellectual awards. Then I found a copy of the Necronomicon. Read it cover to cover twice. Then I prayed to the prince. He heard me. He cured me. His words were like cold water in my face. That's bullshit, man, said one of the students. Think so? Nozick's penetrating blue eyes fixed on the boy. I went from a one hundred pound klutz to this. It was the prince. Thankfully, the class bell sounded. The students filed out, shell shocked by the frank admission. My psyche sufficiently rattled. I began preparations for my next class. I did not notice Mr. Nozick approaching the rostrum. Though he sottled me when he spoke. Professor Ketridge, I noticed the way you listened to my story. Yes. My voice was shaky for no reason. If you'd like to see for yourself, I can offer you an invitation to my church. Maybe you'd like to form your own opinion. His smile was most disarming. I will admit my curiosity is piqued. Good. My place of worship is the corner of Delacroix and West Elm. 
Do you know where that is? I believe I do, Timothy. My response was sluggish. Thank you for the invitation. You're welcome. He let the door close behind him. Had I but known what awaited me, I would have willingly lobotomized the curiosity center of my brain. As it stood, it required one full week before I amassed the fortitude to sally forth. Visiting the unholy dwelling was either accomplished through sheer bravery or utter stupidity. In hindsight, both terms are now synonymous. I must pause, Rita. For now I shall unfold the events of last night. Here, then, is the most trying part of my narration. For my cigarette cash is critically low. The crushed filters spill over the edges of my large ceramic ashtray, like a tidal wave to a crumbling dike. My throat is severely raw, yet it does distract from the throbbing of my temples. I shall persevere, because time is of the essence. If only I... No. The past is now circumspect. The die is cast. The black night shall be revealed. The waxing crescent moon slashed luminously through the ebony sky, igniting pinpoint stars across the heavens. The fading satellite's illumination cast silver fingers of moon glow across the landscape of Waverley's Crossing creating an opaqueness and otherworldly tone to the buildings and countryside. After a laborious day of schooling and most unwilling to retreat to my lonely apartment, I set upon a nocturnal drive through my hometown. The persecuting headlights released passing buildings into my periphery, transforming them into phantom towers where shadows escaped the moonlight. The blurred surroundings release my conscious mind, allowing my subconscious to take the wheel. The haze of non-remembrance lifted as I found myself closing the car door, but I was not home. I can only assume my unthinking mind brought me to the place I now stood, the corner of Delacroix and West Elm. My senses sharpened acutely, and all the oppressive flaccidity of university activity and the subsequent car venture disappeared from limb and mind as I surveyed the suburban environment I had entered. Nozak had not been exact in his directions, for the only building resembling a church was the house adjacent to the dilapidated house, which rested on the intersection. Excited and anxious, I broke through the property line demarcated by the eight-foot fir trees, to get my first glimpse of the Church of the Prince. Pristinely painted was the church, a pure white coating basking serenely in the calm crescent light, a peaceful aura akin to the flower bed of powder blue tulips and snow lilies along the foundation, encircled the church with the cool comfort of a down-filled blanket on a lightless winter day. Moa strokes held order across the length of the front lawn, with only an unmarked sidewalk parting the well-kept sea of grass. The steeple spire harmoniously ascended while visions of Christ and ornate stained glass peered from each window. The montage showed him sermonizing, his trek to Calvary and the bloody crucifixion. This perplexed me. Christ represented so boldly. Was this some weird relishing of Christ's suffering for the prince's followers? Is this a public display meant towards blasphemy? I realized it was not, for in my zealous observation I had missed the white yard placard and the curb. It simply read, the First Church of Christ Jesus, Rev. Dennis Kellogg, Pastor.
Acidic fear pumped through my spine as I crossed back through the phalanx of fir trees. Mr. Narzak was indeed accurate with his directions. Within the weed-infested lot, a crudely constructed curb sign proclaimed, The Church of the Prince. Welcome to all. Repenting of my original oversight, I turned a critical eye upon the church facade. I felt a curious sense of deja vu as I realized the two structures were similar in architectural design. Goose flesh arose, for it felt as if I was seeing an alternate version of the Christ Church, as viewed through a twisted looking glass. Whereas the Christ Church soothingly reflected the moonlight, the Prince Church engulfed the mercurial rays, birthing sinister shadows of malefic intent. The aura encompassing the Prince Church radiated a natural silence, as spidery blackish-green fingers of vegetation clawed the brown foundation. The sweet flower aroma of the Christ Church became a fetid stench of wet earth and stinkweed in the yard of the Prince Church. An ailing spire impotently sagged from the top of the building, as if repulsed from the sky. The stained glass was presented as knotty pine boards haphazardly nailed across the windows without a hint of light from within. My fire of curiosity sufficiently stroked. I aired towards caution and worked my way to the rear of the structure with the hope of a less conspicuous entrance. I retrieved my penlight from my breast pocket of my jacket and proceeded scouting. A rusted steel gate proved to be my only hindrance. Vertigrized and deteriorated, the gate's double-pronged latch refused admittance, forcing me to climb over the neglected portal. The blame of poor upkeep could not be completely attributed to the minions of the prince, for the fence was a man-made shield to a vast graveyard, which encompassed both backyards of the church. My miniature penlight skimmed from headstone to tombstone, glistened upon newer stones, while briefly spotting the worn and less tended markers. It was then... Under the mystic moonbeams, my mind's eye envisioned the struggle between the churches. I imagined the spiritual warfare waged over the decaying and lost souls buried deep in the soil. I could visualize both theological camps forever locked in a vicious circle of death and redemption. Never retreating, never surrendering, never giving ground, never allowing a definitive victor. Registering this observation, I quickly set out to gain entry into the ominous Church of the Prince. Fumbling under the influx of adrenaline, my anxious hands made to open the dilapidated door of the service entrance. Flakes of rust fell precipitously to the overgrown patio as I carefully turned the knob. It was unlocked, to my amazement. As surprising, the door opened soundlessly. No alarming creak or squeak signaled my trespass. I had truly envisioned the sound effects commonly associated with horror movies, yet the door swung inward without timber. I entered, with the silver moon smiling evilly upon my back. My minuscule light confirmed my suspicions. The room was once a storage pantry. The twenty-square-foot room neatly displayed rich, unembellished robes of deep red color on the right. Countering on the left, an antique oak table supported various platters, candelabras, and chalices of brightly polished silver. Additionally, two boxes of tapered twelve-inch black candles lay next to the glittering ware. Besides the door I had just entered, there was another door opposite the room, undoubtedly providing access to the church's inner sanctum. Beyond the door my ears peeked at the sound of low, indecipherable chanting. The chant was both seductive and repulsive. 
Since I detected no break in cadence, I assume my unlawful entrance remained undetected. I, however, was not going to open the door to prove my theory. Limited in options, my resolve began crumbling like sandcastles against the growing tide. It was then my trusty penlight offered another alternative to the humming portal. Obscured behind the robes, a skeletal ladder of wrought iron scaled the wall, escaping into the inky darkness above the pantry ceiling. Before I accepted its invitation, my rational mind pro-offered a preventative measure to be taken. Stripping a lump of wax from candle cord wick, I neatly weighted the malleable black substance into the internal door's keyhole, effectively jamming the door's locking mechanism closed. As an extra precaution, I left the outer door slightly ajar for a quicker retreat. With my clever machinations in place, I clenched my penlight between my teeth and began ascending the solid ladder. As I surmised, the ladder opened into a maintenance walkway, which encompassed the interior of the church. Abandoned cobwebs, choking dust motes, and a cloying, musty odor were the only furnishings here. For no particular reason, I continued forward with only my small halogen beam leading the way. Cautiously traversing the cramped walkway, I discovered a basketball-sized hole in the ceiling. Undoubtedly, a lighting fixture once resided here, breaching the rotted lathe wood and crumbling ceiling drywall. A somber light from below filtered up through the hole, along with a faint aroma of spicy incense. I swallowed hard and proceeded to gown on my first view of the congregational hall of the Church of the Prince. Approximately 150 feet in length and 75 feet in width were the temple's dimensions. Black paint inundated the walls and steeple ceiling, which made accurate measurements difficult to determine. Deep mahogany pews upholstered in plush wine fabric composed three distinctive rows. Five-foot-tall, freestanding silver candelabras bookmarked each entrance to the pews. Each candelabra maintained a single black candle, flickering a dark light. Two dingy scarlet rugs divided the rows like pulsing arteries leading to the dais. The altar itself stood four feet in height, measured six feet across, and was completely composed of bloodstone. Bloodstone is a jet-black rock with tiny veins of cardinal red sediment running throughout. I had never thought a geological wonder such as this could ever be termed as sinister, However, as it lay in a circle of arcane power carved on the floor, my opinion quickly changed. The finishing touch had shining silver braziers just outside the circle at each star point, lazily churning out the heady incense I had previously detected. The parishioners were seated on the pews in their voluminous, gender-obscuring robes. The rumbling chant of the followers echoed through the chamber as a dark chorus of obscene strength. Of the crowd below, three made their way to the dais. These three were set apart from the rest due to the black sashes they wore. One of the three was further placed apart from the other two, for the black sash worn was covered with malefic silver runes of a forgotten language. The obscured parishioners continued the unholy course from unseen mouths until the three were positioned correctly on the platform. The atmosphere, although macabre and haunting, drew me into the ambience of the thumbing cords. I felt light-headed, almost mesmerized by the chant. It was only when the high priest held his hands aloft silencing the siren's call that my senses suddenly flooded back, and I found myself in a heightened state of attentiveness. The awakening is at hand. The priest's baritone split the fresh silence. Let the vessel of our Lord approach. In the first pew of the center section, a single figure rose and strode confidently onto the platform. 
The figure knelt briefly before the altar, then stood motionless before the onlookers. The two in simple black sashes opened the vessel's robe, allowing it to fall around the vessel's feet. Within the robe a nude figure was revealed. His Olympian physique glistened in the low candlelight, and his penis was erect with the promise of things to come. Strands of feathered blonde hair framed his statuesque face. As piercing blue eyes surveyed the red-robed audience without emotion, a frigid fear engulfed me. Tim Nozak was the vessel. The high priest's hooded eyes twinkled animalistically as he produced a wickedly curved dagger encrusted with stones. The priest presented the dagger to Nozak, who graciously accepted. Now begins the time of the prince, the priest boomed, inspiring the parishioners into chanting. I need not have looked at my watch to know it was midnight. The stifling apprehension in my heart confirmed the time. In a language ancient and foul, the three priests began a resuscitation which could only be construed as spellcasting. The phonics sounded like a bastardized version of Latin, yet far older and decidedly diabolical. My intuition begged me to leave at this point, yet I could not cease my voyeurism. I had to know. It is only now do I regret my damnable curiosity. Nozak grasped the dagger with both hands, pointing it towards his defined chest. His expression never changed as he brought the knife to his bosom. Nozak calmly introduced long, superficial cuts into his flesh. Droplets of crimson lazily dribbled down his chest, splattering his feet and cold platform below. At no time did he show the effects of the dagger. His face remained a stolid mask of non-expression. Nozak's final act of self-mutilation had the shining blade encircling the newly carved five-point star, completing the pentacle forged in the flesh of his broad chest. The dagger fell from his hand, clattering noisily to the floor. Immediately the priests were beside him, leading him to the bloodstone altar. The trio laid Nozick upon the altar and vacated the pentagram on the floor, never breaking their abhorrent cadence. I cannot confirm the final breathless words of Tim Nozak as he lay bleeding to death on the cold slab of ghastly stone. Yet I would testify, he mouthed, Thy will be done, prince. It was then the fantastic supplanted reality. The five braziers erupted, spewing sickly colored plumes. The smoke never left the circle of power on the floor, preferring to twist and turn within its confines. Each brazier vomited stark individual shades of darkest tones, neither color supplanting nor diluting the others. The smog danced above Nozick in a vulgar choreography of spasmodic threads. The spicy aroma of incense had also retreated, leaving the foul, corrosive air of things ancient dead and decaying. It was then my unbelieving eyes caught the face of Death Dealer Nozak. The confident, arrogant smile of Nozak had melted away, leaving a face of paralyzed distress. My jaw literally fell slack as I noticed the spotches of crimson on the dagger and platform began coagulating. The blood defied gravity. My constitution lurched as the mist of blasphemous colors glowed as if vitalized or brought to life by the absorbed blood. If the malefic cloud were alive, the life essence it had taken surely did not satisfy its craving. Rivulets of blood flowed away from Nozick's body, a crimson sprinkle of reverse rain. The crude pentacle etched on his chest suddenly burst like an overtaxed dam. More accurately, the blood gushed upwards as if it were a faucet, abruptly thrust to a full open. The geyser of crimson life ascended, brutally draining its victim. This fact did not escape Nozak's attention. I could never, 
even if given multiple lifetimes, described Nozak's face and the way it twisted into a soundless, futile plea of terror and despair. I believe watching your very life essence being slowly consumed to be in the realm that eclipses any nightmare the subconscious mind could create. Nozak's back arched shockingly, attempting to rid himself of the obvious agony coursing through his frame. His massive hands clenched and unclenched in futility as the seemingly endless flow of crimson continued. I watched like a disembodied spirit as his tan body blanched under the assault. Somewhere in my mind, a small prayer was said for the poor boy to end his suffering. While it seemed like eons of torture, the macabre siphoning lasted but a minute, perhaps two. Nozak's hollow eyes fixed upon the final red dropulet. It bobbed in midair, bidding a final adieu, then joined its kindred in the foul storm of colors hovering above. Nozak's body relaxed from the assault, and he exhaled a ragged breath of relief. A sudden recognition dawned upon his pale face. It was more than a spasmodic exhalation his lungs performed. It was the expiration of life itself. Tim Nozak offered a final expression of unbelieving betrayal as he heard his own death rattle and collapsed. Willing to embrace the concept of utter madness to retain the final drams of sanity I tenuously held, I found myself unable to detach myself from the continuing saga. I watched the high priest break cadence. In the tongue of an ancient bastard language, he chanted directly at the throbbing cloud. The words that had spewed from his vile lips affected the cloud. It swayed like a cobra to a fakir's seductive flute. Oh, dear reader, I can never relate the sheer horrific numbness as I watched spindly fingers emerge from the thing and descend. The colorful tendrils lovingly caressed the gouged pentagram on Nozak's chest, then proceeded to seep into the carved cracks. The malefic fog pulsed vibrantly, as its mass dwindled into the pentagram, flowing like smoke under a closed door. Once the final wisp of the cloud had invaded the corpse, the fleshy pentacle briefly flashed a phosphorescent hue and faded away. It was not my imagination that observed Nozak's skin pallor reverting back to its golden tan, nor did I dream the sliced flesh begin to mend with deliberation. However, I prayed I dreamt the sight of Nozak's dead corpse sit upright, issuing slight wisps of the colored vapor from the mouth. The thing that was no longer Tim Nozak, disoriented in its new form, glared about the foul church. The corpse swung its feet haphazardly over the altar and to the floor, babbling cryptic words of an abhorrent, long-dead language to itself. It walked, at first with a toddler's fumbling steps, then matured its gait. With the improvements of the physical, its speech seemed to progress. Germanic to Pick, then to Saxon, and finally, English. The thing observed his silent congregation as the three priests swathed his new body in an indigo robe covered with sharp, twisted runes. He raised his hands in the air and beamed horribly at his followers, causing them to fall to their collective knees in awe and homage. In a voice of bottomless evil, two words issued from his lips like a thunderclap as the prince spoke with all the venom of the netherworld. Worship me. My fragile intellect became a pane of glass with the prince's words striking me like a brick. I shattered and quickly sought escape from this waking nightmare. I do not recall where I received the bruised discolor in my left cheek, nor can I explain the clotted gash on my right forearm. The only incident I can recall were the parishioners cursing and pounding the inner door that I had wax-trapped as I made my way to freedom. 
I quickly made my way to the outer door and breathed a sigh of relief as I fled the abominable structure. Then I froze. Warm urine flowed unchecked down my trouser leg, pooled in my loafer and puddled underfoot. Terror, brisk and uncontrollable, constricted my windpipe like Perseus gazing into Medusa's scaly face. How I would have welcomed turning to stone. Instead, the deep blue eyes of a dead man pierced my soul with a razor-blade stare. In that instant, I knew the eyes of Tim Nozak were, in fact, now portals of the prince, our gaze locked for an eternity. My mind purged itself of all memories, all wisdom, all dreams, all possible futures. Rigor mortis crept into my muscles as the prince offered a Cheshire grin on his stolen face. The large sliver of the moon over its shoulder looked like the reaper's sickle ready to harvest. The prince looked at me, and the night filled with his unholy laughter. I spared no second glance as I fled. Its hollow, humorless laugh reverberated in my ears. The mocking chuckle from the lips of a dead man can never be erased from my poor mind, no matter how much I pray for cessation. In... Reviewing these cramped pages of dissertation, I mournfully extinguish my final cigarette. I shall not journey out for more. I can no longer leave my apartment. Why is this, dear reader? When I returned from my last nicotine expedition, I discovered a large, innocuous brown paper package upon my doorstep. There was neither card nor return address enclosed. Inside the brown folds of paper, I discovered a pristine olive drab body bag, reeking of newness and bodily decay. Although it would have substantiated my claims, I threw the abhorrent thing down the incinerator chute. Keeping the blasted thing would surely have destroyed any fragments of my psyche that remain. Should I have kept it? It does not matter now. Such observations are moot. I have gazed into the piercing blue eyes of the abyss and found my soul condemned. For you see, the Prince of Darkness walks the earth. And he knows my name. Thank you for listening. If you haven't already, don't forget to cast your vote for this contestant via either a thumbs up or thumbs down vote. By doing so, you'll help us determine who will become the next permanent member of our voice acting team. At the close of voting on September 23rd, based on your votes, the top five contestants will progress to the fourth and final round to take place live on October 31st at our annual Halloween live stream event, based entirely on your votes. Thank you for voting and for helping to spread the word. You're listening to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. I'm Steve Taylor, host of Chilling Tales, the podcast, encouraging you to turn off the lights. And turn on the dark. Chilling Tales for Dark Nights.